Thank you everyone for joining me on What's Your Story. I'm your host, Emmanuel Mutui. And today's guest is, uh, I've been trying to get him for a while and when I did have him come on the show, I forgot to bring cameras to the interview. And so he, so he was so gracious, he decided to do it again. And so here we are. And I know you'll be blessed by his story. It's an amazing story that I know bits and pieces of it anyway. But let's just dive in. Glenn, hey, thank you for thanks coming. Thanks for having me. So we're here with the cameras today. So I know I, this is all going to be a success. I yes, it will be. And we got the audio equipment yeah, working audio too. Working, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? I grew up in the Northwest, uh, mm -hmm. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana area. Okay. My dad was the uh, the head of the survey section for the Corps of Engineers, mm -hmm. and literally his job was every time one of the new dams went on on the rivers, we went in and surveyed the whole area where the dam was going to go, all the backfill water and all that. So wow. when I was young, we moved a lot. Hmm. Uh, sometimes only being in school for two, three weeks at a time, and then it was like up into the next next job site. So uh, wow. I got to see a lot of the really gorgeous mm -hmm. area that we call God's country up in the yeah. northwest there, so it was pretty. How did that affect you in building relationships with people your same age? It was difficult. It yeah. was... Uh, it was, it was a lot like, you know, relationships are something that generally take time. You didn't have time. Mm -hmm. So when you came into a new community, I mean, you immediately just assimilated as quick as you could. You got mm -hmm. on whatever sports you were playing. Mm -hmm. You know, you signed up for different clubs. Yeah. Uh, you, just, you just didn't take the time that most people have to say, well, I'm going to sit back and see what's going to happen. Yeah. You didn't have that. Mm -hmm. But you, the negative side of that is the fact that uh, relationships were not something that you felt very deep about because you knew they were only temporary. Mm -hmm. So you didn't form any lasting relationships. You had a lot of acquaintances, yeah. the people you knew and, and had fun with and did things with. But, mm -hmm. you know, you may come home the next day and find out, hey, we're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> and away you went. You know? Yeah, I understand that because when I came here from Kenya, like all my relationships just like that because we came like immediately. We didn't have, we didn't even know. We got our visas. My mom was like, we're going next week. Like, wait, what? And gone. So I understand some of that. So as you're moving a lot, did you want to do what your dad did or did you have a different vision for your life? You know, I really didn't think about it too much. I mean, uh, the good thing was that dad taught me how to survey. And so, uh, and I liked what he did. I liked the fact that I was outside uh, working and not behind a, a desk sitting in an office somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by 18 years old, I had my own survey crew and was uh, literally, I reserved in the Nespers Indian Indian boundaries and we surveyed in the, uh, the backfill area behind some dams. So I ran my own crew at 18 years old uh, as a contract crew to the Corps of Engineers. What the heck? That's amazing. How, how long did you do that? I only did, well, I actually only did it for about a year because mm. what happened was, uh, well, at that, that age, this was, uh, I got out of high school at uh, 17. I only had one class a year, my, my senior year. I literally was done with high school when I was 16 mm. uh, and then was going to community college and I was running the survey uh, crew up in Idaho and had just started the University of Idaho when I had one of those, those, you know, significant emotional events where I had a, a real close person to me die mm -hmm. and my grade point went into the gutter and I came up number 69 on the draft number oh. and it was like, you know, I think maybe God's telling me I'm going to go do something different. <laughs> so, uh, so I left, I left school February of, uh, 71 mm. and joined the Marine Corps and, wow. uh, okay. cause I figured might as well learn to trade. Yeah, there was. Uh, we were still in Vietnam at the time, and uh, I felt well. If I can't do anything here, I'm going to get drafted anyway. I might as well join what I considered the best fighting force at the time. They're going to train me because I did kind of want to stay alive. <laughs> I found that's important in life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I went into the Marine Corps. Okay. In February '71. So when when you chose you, when you chose to go to the Marine Corps, did you? No, because I know I'm, I'm not well versed in our military. Well, American military, I'm not from around here. Did you choose what you wanted to do or were you just going to go study in infantry? Yes. Okay. What I was going to do was I was going to go straight infantry. Okay. Uh, so I went through boot camp at the Marine Corps uh, Recruit Depot there in San Diego. And I did really good in boot camp. And they do a series of tests to see what you're good at. Mm -hmm. 
So I figured I was just going to be an infantryman. That's what I went in to do. Okay. And I guess I scored uh, like 144 or something on this test. And they came down and said, you're not going to be an infantryman. Uh, your scores are way too high. And we're going to put you in communications uh, and go to 29 Palms for a while, get trained in all the radios. And then I got trained in uh, crypto gear, which is all your cipher communication gear that all, makes it all secure and secret. Mm -hmm. And I came out of that with a uh, unlimited crypto uh, assignment, okay. which was rather unique in and of itself because with the assignment meant that I had to memorize every one of the schematics to every one of the equip pieces of equipment that I was responsible for repairing. Mm -hmm. And then I had uh, the first recon uh, battalion assign three guys to me. It was their job to keep me safe or to kill me. So for 10 years, I was killed before capture. I had a KBC designator on my jacket that said, if we were overrun or if we were in a situation where it looked like I might fall into enemy hands because I had everything memorized in my head, yeah. then it was their job to make sure I was dead and it, or, or all of us were dead. I always reminded them that I was one fourth of the firepower, that we'd better at least get into the fight first before they made that decision. But uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting position. How, well, how do you mentally live with that for 10 years? You get used to it. <laughs> There's a lot of things in life you can get used to. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to put, uh, you know, you really have to put your faith in God yeah. and say, this is uh, the way it's going to be. Huh. And I, I kind of expect you to uh, protect me. It was funny because uh, throughout history, mm -hmm. you know, you've heard of uh, Stonewall Jackson during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. People asked him the same thing. How can you just ride into battle on your horse? and not worry about things. And his answer was, God knows the timing for me. If I'm gonna die in this battle, I'm gonna die anyway, or I'm gonna be alive. So he says, I have to have faith in the fact that my creator mm -hmm. is gonna look after me and my timing's in his hands, not mine. Wow. And, and it worked out that way uh, yeah. uh, throughout my, my military career. There were some things that were just, mm -hmm. if I hadn't been looked after, yeah. I wouldn't be here today. Wow. Actually, I've been skipped an important question. When did you get saved? Oh, how was your Christian journey as you joined the military? When did that journey begin? Or were you already a Christian by the time you joined the military? It was before I joined the military. Okay. As far as being able to sit down, so I've had people tell me that. Oh, yeah, it was, you know, November 22nd at 10 o'clock. I accepted the Lord and went forward. And I'm going, <laughs> wow, I don't remember that. <laughs> okay. It was kind of a process. Mm -hmm. uh, I was baptized in the Columbia River when I was eight. Okay. Um, and of course went through the whole, you know, you go to Sunday school and mm -hmm. back then Sunday school was in somebody's garage, mm -hmm. you know, and with a wife, somebody's wife, the pastor's wife teaching it or something because it was pretty small and you're moving a lot. These were small towns. Uh, it was just a realization over time, probably by the time I was 12, that I knew God was there. Mm -hmm. And looking back, if we can do a real quick reverse all the way back to earlier time, mm -hmm. at six years old, I didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. I was visited by my guardian angel. Oh! I woke up one night mm -hmm. and realized there was a presence in the room. Mm -hmm. And you know when you're little, you do weird things. So I was laying there and I rolled over and looked. And standing in the room was the image of an angel. It went as tall as the top of the, of, the, of the roof, standing there looking at me. And of course, at six years old, I thought it was a ghost. And at six years old, what do you do to protect yourself? Mom. Not yet, you duck under the covers, because if you can't see it, it can't see you. And so I went, am I awake? I remember asking myself these things, am I awake or am I dreaming? And I thought, no, I'm awake. So I pulled the covers back to look again, and the angel had bent down, and we were face to face. And it reached over and put a kiss on my cheek, and then just evaporated through the wall. That's when the scream came out. And I jumped up and ran for the door that I thought was the hallway, but I'd gotten turned around. And I ran straight into the closet and flipped upside down into the clothes hamper. And that's where my mom found me with my feet sticking out, screaming and yelling uh, upside down in the clothes hamper. So it was, like I said, it was a significant emotional event and stuck with me. And I, I didn't think about it till many years later when I went, that wasn't a ghost. That was my angel keeping an eye on me. How? <laughs> now, like the next day when you wake up, like what's, your, what are you, what's going through your mind? I don't remember. Oh. I just don't remember. I mean, it was one wow. of those, like I said, at six years old, you're kind of like, 
probably what went through my mind was, I think I'll go outside and play with the dog. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, you don't give too much thought about it at yeah. six years old. You're still alive, you're good, and, uh, and you got pulled out of the clothes hamper. So, yeah, yeah, life went on. Wow. So did that, like, when you were 12 or whatever, when you're taking that, making that serious decision to be a believer, did that event affect anything or did you already forget about it? No, it actually, I think, probably affected everything forward because mm -hmm. uh, I always knew that there was something, someone there looking after me, and of course, mm -hmm. it was God. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the Holy Spirit had, had actually come down and, and mm -hmm. whispered in your ear during those quiet moments mm -hmm. and said, well, I think you need to do this or you need to do that, and it kind of comes to fruition that mm -hmm. really, uh, really confirms yeah. some of the stuff that happens. And so, you know, what day was I saved? I don't know. But it just kind of over time yeah. evolved as a knowledge that mm -hmm. God was real. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus died for me. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit has been watching after me along with, uh, yeah. with this angel that's yeah. evidently, evidently there. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back to your military time. So you, you know, you're, living with this li you're living a life of, if you end up attack, my own, uh, not teammates, my own brethren in their arms, they might kill me if you get overrun. And so what, in this 10 year period, what was your main job? Was it just memorizing this crypto, what is it, crypto what? Crypto. Crypto information and just storing them? Or like, what was, what were you doing other things inside of that? I ran what's called an intermediate cryptographic repair site. Okay. Uh, so when we went forward, like I said, we were in Vietnam at the time. Every time uh, the radios have these attached to them, they're kind of an attachment thing, mm -hmm. they went out uh, on patrols, if the patrol got shot up or got ambushed or something else, and the, and the equipment got got in trouble, and they had we had the same thing in helicopters. Then, after the combat piece of it was gone, me and these three guys then got into a helicopter and went to the site to visit it to recover the equipment, make sure it hadn't been compromised, fix it if I could, mm -hmm. and I took it back. And I had like three guys uh, working for me. By then, I was already a corporal going on sergeant okay and uh so we brought it back and fixed it and mm -hmm. either if it could be fixed put it back in uniform yeah. you know back in operation or uh, because it was sensitive equipment then you had to record serial numbers and stuff and say yeah. this no longer exists it's mm -hmm. gone true and we'd get rid of it Cause so you because you eventually rose to a general how, how, what was that journey the general the my career progression yes well, it wasn't normal, that's for sure. Uh, I got out of the Marines in 77 okay. as a staff sergeant. Went back to the University of Idaho. Uh, everybody says, well, with all this electronic background you've got, just go get an electrical engineer degree. should be easy. But, you know, six years in the Marine Corps uh, with Vietnam and then getting out and going through uh, the drawdown and all that after uh, in the mid-70s, I just didn't have the heart for it. So I went into radio and television. And I got a radio and television degree. I uh, ran programming for KUID TV at the University of Idaho. Mm -hmm. We produced, we were busy doing documentaries. I mean, tough stuff, right? Did yeah. a documentary on whitewater rafting. I mean, that was tough. On going hunting, yeah, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, who wants to go on this documentary? <laughs> so, uh, so then the university picked me up as an instructor for uh, electronic news gathering. Okay. And uh, I taught editing, and then I went to work for the Ag Information Bureau and literally ran the Ag Information Bureau for the university, which impacted the whole state. Uh, we produced 130 half-hour programs in a year and a half. That's a lot. That's a lot. And we were like the first ones to break the story on ethanol and how you could gross corn and turn it into fuel and all that. So it was fun, but, you know, by... Uh, 1981. So at this point, how many years are you out? Like five years? I've been out, yeah, almost five years. It was four and a half years. So I went back to uh, the recruiting station and said, I like what I'm doing, but I'm not making a whole lot of money. And I'm kind of stuck doing this. And although we're doing a lot of things, I, I, I kind of would like to come back in the military as an officer. And uh, the Marine Corps said, no, we don't take people back because you've been out almost five years and five years is our barrier. We don't take people back. And I said, I got it. I'm no longer brainwashed. I know hey diddle diddle straight up the middle against a machine gun nest is probably not a smart thing to do. And they were like, yeah, see that just proved our point. And I went, so I turned around and was gonna walk out and uh, I told them on the way, I said, you should check my record. Uh, 
because by then I had been, I had two meritorious promotions, I mean, uh, and I had all this training. And on the way out, an Army guy stood up and grabbed me by the arm and said, I can commission you in 90 days if you want to come back. And so that's what I did. I went in the Army. Wow, okay. I didn't know you could switch between the two. Well, I was already out. Uh, okay. And they had uh, officer candidate school, which had a college option. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you finish college and got your degree, which they uh, require, then you just go to uh, Fort Benning to OCS, officer candidate school. You spend okay. three months there mm -hmm. going through their trials. Yeah. It's kind of like the Army's version of Marine Corps boot camp. All the mental games, all crazy stuff. You show up, they've totally dismantled your room and it's laying out in the, in the grass beyond the building and you're on the third floor and they go, okay, you've got six minutes and we're gonna inspect your room. Which meant you had to get all your bed and all the, everything up there and you had to get it all done and in six minutes stand and be standing tall. So it was a mental game while they were teaching you all the, uh, basically, uh, infantry basic course is what it was huh. with, with the mental game to see if you could handle mm -hmm. the stress. I mean, they're up in your face all the time. Make a decision, make a decision. And so you got so you made decisions. I suppose, wow. Or you did a lot of push ups. <laughs> I chose decisions. Yeah. So, what did you do as an officer in the Army? Well, I got commissioned armor coming out of there, which was kind of interesting. I thought, well, I've got a radio and television degree. Obviously, they're going to try to put me into mm -hmm. public affairs or something. But I got commissioned armor. Um, what does that mean? Hmm? Commissioned armor, what is that? Tanks. Okay. Yeah. So I got commissioned as a, as a, as a tank officer. Went to Fort Knox, uh, got trained up there, and then my first assignment was during the Cold War. And I got sent to the 1st uh, Brigade, 3rd Armored Division, which was at Bootsbach, Germany. And we were still running at that point a defensive line uh, along the Fulda Gap and all between Germany and what used to be East Germany and Czechoslovakia and all that, that, yeah. that first line of uh, defense. And I did that for three years. I was the farthest platoon towards the Russian front. I had my platoon of tanks and I had uh, infantry with me and I had call for fire. I had all, I had all kinds of stuff. And I had like three bridges behind me that when I crossed over them, this seems to be an ongoing scenario, the colonel said, you know this is a dip mission. And I said, yeah, die in place. They're, I said, you're going to blow the bridges behind me and I can't get back. And he said, yeah, that's about it. Once again, very reassuring. So I, I did that. I was an executive officer for both a line company, a uh, headquarters company. Uh, we got the first uh, M1 tanks that were issued and did the test on them. In 1985, uh, we did the getting everybody up to speed. And then in 87, uh, the group that I helped train took the Canadian Army Trophy, which was a, it was a tank com competition through all the NATO nations. And uh, the platoon I trained, I didn't go with them, but the one I trained took first place in that gunnery system. Wow. And the guy who ran that platoon rose to the rank of four-star general and became the vice chief of staff of the army later on, uh, wow. Pete, Pete Corelli. Yeah. So uh, came, I came back to the States in 1985, mm -hmm. thinking I was going to go to the advanced course for being an armor officer. And they said, no, because you have jungle experience, because you've done all this infantry stuff with the Marine Corps, you've had a, you know infantry assigned to you, even as a lieutenant, doing stuff. So they sent me to advanced infantry school at Benning. So then I became a qualified infantry officer on top of being a qualified armor officer. And uh, there was only four of us in 400 uh, people that were armored that were there. I was one of the four. And uh, wow. went on from that to be assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division. Okay. Thinking I was going to get a company command as a captain. At this mm -hmm. point now I'm a captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division at the time was a gentleman by the name of... Uh, Major General John J. Yosak. Okay. And he was a deputy commander under Schwarzkopf during De Desert Storm. So I showed up and he says, I know you're a captain. I've got a lieutenant colonel that's in charge of all these operations when we go to the field. But I got him doing other things. He says, you're my operations officer. You're going to fight this division for me as a captain. So as a captain, I stepped into a lieutenant colonel's position and ran the whole battle 
anytime the division moved out to the field to do exercises and that sort of thing. And uh, my fire support officer was a major at the time by the name of Tommy Franks, okay. who winds up also becoming a four-star general. And it's the general in charge that I handed off to when we went back in for Operation Iraqi Freedom. And so I briefed him, we used to laugh, because I briefed him on what he needed to do and how the plan worked and all that thing with Rumsfeld. And we, we kind of talked about times with the first Cav. And it was kinda, like I said, it's kind of funny. You meet these people at lower ranks, mm -hmm. and then later you're back working with them while they're yeah. generals or, or <laughs> other things. So it was kind of interesting. So, and that became real interesting. Uh, once again, uh, the career wasn't a normal career. Yeah. In uh, 86, as the operations officer, I came to work and the general came in. He always smoked a cigar. He says, you know, Glenn, it's Thursday. He said, I want you to go home and pack your bags. Okay. And I looked at him and I said, okay, where am I going and what uniforms do I need? He says, no, no, don't, don't pack any uniforms. That should have been the first sign where I went, this is not going the direction I thought it was going to go. And he says, I want you to go over to Gray Airfield Monday, be there at 7 o'clock, and I'll meet you there and I'll tell you what you're doing. Okay. So I packed, you know, whatever I thought. I packed blue jeans and some boots and a few other things and went fine. I thought I was probably going to a conference or a meeting or something, and he just didn't bother tell me. So he shows up at the airfield and he says, I'm sending you down to Honduras in support of El Salvador. And you're taking 40 Green Berets with you. You're taking attack helicopters, transportation helicopters. We had four uh, UH-1 Hueys. And I'm gonna, uh, they're waiting for you. you go check in with the, uh, with the uh, ambassador in, in El Salvador. And that's all been set up. And you're going to run uh, support to the combat operation that's going on down there. What? And I went, sir, I'm a captain. <laughs> way beyond my rank. Way beyond what I should be doing. Yeah. And he says, well, the caveat is once again this. If you get captured or killed, we're going to say we had no idea why you were there. That's why you're not in uniform. And I went, oh, that's reassuring. <laughs> so once again, so I took this group into Honduras and we went back and forth and uh, supported the... Uh, the El Salvadorian Army during that whole time. How long were you there? I was there for a little under a year. So at this point, do you have a family? Have you met your wife? No. I not guess a, you can do this with not, your single. Not at this point, no. Yeah. Wow. Is, were, you, did, were you excited to get the assignment or were you like a little nervous? What was your, what was your thought process when they assigned you that? That's a big, that's a big assignment. It was. Uh, yeah, it should have been a colonel or higher. Yeah. Uh, what happens in those situations are which I experienced uh, earlier on in my career, when you find yourself in combat, mm -hmm. you get used to the adrenaline rush. You've got people in the States now that run around and take meth and all these other things that get them hopped up. Mm -hmm. You get in a situation where tracers are shooting past you and uh, you know, you're sitting behind a machine gun in a helicopter going, you know, all that. The adrenaline surge in your body is such that you get so you actually like it. So you're, you don't feel fear at the time. And there's a lot of things going on in your head, but it's really, it's just one of those things that you are very excited and uh, focused, yeah. extremely focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get so, you kind of look forward to it. So it didn't bother me at all. Wow. The only time it ever bothered me is when we took, some, we took some, some rounds flying between Honduras and El Salvador. And they come shooting past the helicopter and I was sitting behind the machine gun in what they call the hell hole on a UH-1. And the pilot's yelling, shoot back. And I'm going, I forgot to load the machine gun. <laughs> I got loaded about that fast. <laughs> and we returned fire. But at the time, it was like, I was looking at the countryside. It was like, it's gorgeous down there. There's palm trees, you know, and banana groves and all this stuff going on. I'm going, what are we doing in combat in this gorgeous little country? And then the things start shooting past you. And then at which point, that all changes. You're going, yeah, like, oh, oh, that's why we're here. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of gets your focus good. But... Uh, that came, when I came back from that, I went back and they gave me a company. Mm. What does that mean? So I had my own company. That means you have three platoons of tanks, four tanks each, a tank for me and a tank for my executive officer. So I'm running a company that had about 100 people. Okay. 
And uh, still a captain? Hmm? Are you still a captain? Or did I'm still a captain. Uh, and I, I ran that company. Uh, and in 1988, 89, uh, I got knighted for my work with, uh, with working with cavalry. We were a combined arms unit, so we had infantry and tanks and all kinds of stuff. And because of, based on performance criteria, uh, I got knighted. Is that like the same thing as like, the Queen knights you? Well, it wasn't the Queen. It's the, uh, the Armor Association of the United States Army knighted me. So what does that mean? That means I got to get to go down on my knees like they do and do the huh. whole sword ceremony and wear a sash that was red and white for armor. And I've got a big old medals about this big around. Huh. You're knighted into what's called the Order of St. George, okay. which is a global organization mm -hmm. of military people. Uh, Russia has an Order of St. George. I mean, the NATO nations have Order of St. George. Uh, it's all about a combat organization. So, so are you Sir Glenn? So I guess, yeah, I'd be Sir Glenn, actually. But it doesn't do any good here in the States because no. nobody's used to it. Yeah. But when you go into places like Africa, uh -huh. especially places like uh, Ro former Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe in that area, mm -hmm. well, they had English there before. Yeah. So titles still mean something. Uh -huh. Or if you go to England, titles still mean something. Yeah, so or if you're in Europe, titles still kind of mean something. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States, they're like, yeah, mm, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't get about that. So, uh, huh? So that happened in '89, uh, and of course, as you know, Desert Storm was in '90. Yeah. Uh, my company uh, was the top shooting company in the army. Mm -hmm. mm. We had out. She got shot every tank in over a hundred battalions. We set a record for being able to have 80% first round hits going across the combat field uh, at 50 miles an hour. And uh, I had the two sh top shooting platoons yeah. uh, and wound up with a, my own separate flag of tactical platoon award and some other stuff. So we did all that because literally back then we had just gotten into simulations mm -hmm. and they had a simulation center where you could simulate tank combat. Yeah. And I immediately recognized the value of it. So I made sure every one of my people were certified in, hmm. in simulations before we ever went out. Hmm. And it, it just happened to show when yeah. the real shooting started, then mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. guys were really, really trained and others were still going through the whole thing and getting commands down and that kind of stuff. Wow. So that was done. And when you get done with that, it was funny because uh, one of the generals got up on my tank, I was sitting in the desert and he comes up and says, well, that was great. He says, that was some of the fastest, best maneuver I've seen, and you're done. And I handed my company over to somebody else, and I went back to teach ROTC at Washington State University, reserve officer training. I had done enough of that, and they were, it was time for me to hand, hand over the flag to somebody new. What the heck? So I did that and got promoted uh, to major, and uh, that was fun. I spent... Mm -hmm. uh, two and a half years working uh, with college students. Nice, nice. And every morning, uh, Dan O'Brien, who was working at the decathlete at the time, uh, he's an athlete, okay. uh, would come by and me and the cadets would go for the first like four mile run with him. And then he'd go, okay, I'm warmed up, and away you go. And we'd all look at each other going, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Tired out, burned out, sweaty, and uh, he's off doing his run for another 15, 20 miles, you know, so you're, you're sitting here going, okay, that was fun. That was levels to this. Yeah, but uh, it was like today. I had uh, numerous cadets that I trained that got out as full bird colonels. One of them today is the advisor to uh, Pacific Command in Hawaii. Hmm. Uh, I've got others that raced to the, to the rank of general. Uh, just, you know, they were fun and working with the college students were a lot of fun and that's, yeah. that's where I met my wife. She was at a different university actually dating somebody else. Oh. And uh, she came down to visit, the, had friends at the ROTC department and uh, she was going to a different school in the ROTC department and was getting her nursing degree. And she came down and said, well, I hear you're beating everybody down here playing racquetball. I said, yeah, I haven't found anybody that can beat me. I'm 40 years old by now. And she's like, hmm. She said, well, that's kind of an egotistical statement, isn't it? And I said, it's not egotistical if you can back it up. Nobody's beat me. <laughs> she says, how about you play my boyfriend next weekend? Oh. And I said, 
done. That's pretty cocky. Yeah. And uh, so she showed up with this guy. And I go down to the racquetball court and I look over here and she's got all my cadets, all the kids I'm teaching, college students, are sitting in the stands behind this glass backboard racquetball court. <clears throat> so I stepped in, you know, we shook hands and the whole bit. Yeah. And uh, just as I'm going through the door, she smiles at me and says, oh, I forgot to tell you, he's ranked number two in the state. Hmm, state you up. I got slaughtered. <laughs> I mean, it was embarrassing. And uh, my wife thought it was real funny. And uh, I looked at her and said, you're gonna pay for that. And she did, six months later I married her. Oh, well, I guess she's paid for that. And we've been married 28 years, and of course David's uh, yeah. my son. And, Who's helping us, thank you David, yeah. by the way. And uh, that led into a whole other series of challenges where God had to be with me. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he'd been with me before. When I was in Europe, I went down twice in helicopters and uh, got ran over by a tank and a few other things, but uh, I lived through all that. Wait, how do you get run over by a tank? And You're sleeping on the ground. And as a, tank, I, as a tank comes along, it runs over your sleeping bag, and you roll out of the way just enough not to get crushed, but you can't get out of the bag because you're totally pinned down. The guy in the tank would have moved one way or another. I'd just been dead almost instantly by being run over by this tank. But I, he ran off and... Uh, and I went, okay, I'm alive, got up and said, I won't sleep on the ground anymore. So I moved over and slept on a cot in 1985 when I was doing operations for the 1st Cav Division. Mm -hmm. And the commander called me in at two in the morning and said, why did you do certain things during the combat thing? And I went, well, here was the opportunity. Here's what I did, here's why I did it. And he says, okay, that was a good call. He said, I wish I'd have made it, but I wasn't here, so you had to make it. And he says, yes. I can tell people I made it, and I said, well, I don't care, sir, what you do? I mean, you're a general, and I'm a, yeah. I'm a captain at this point. So I went back out to my cot, totally demolished. The tank had run right over in the middle of the night, and everything was gone. I mean, it was tore up, my sleeping bag was ripped all apart, and there where I had been sleeping, yeah, had, had been run over by a tank. <laughs> I, this, one, this time for good. Well, yeah, well, you got to figure timing. Yes, Somebody looking after you. Definitely. Yeah. God is working. So anyway, mm -hmm. fast forward back to ROTC. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I uh, decided we had a lot in common. And uh, we, I asked her to marry me after only going out with her for like six, seven weeks. She said yes. We got married on a Thursday. I reported to work on a Monday and was put under arrest because the Army figured that if I was a major and she was becoming a lieutenant in the army, although she was somewhere else in a different school, not under my command, then I must have used my rank to influence her to marry me. I was 40, she was 22. Wow. So I was under house arrest for 239 days while they, that while they did what's called a 15-6 investigation to talk to everybody to see if maybe this was something that had been going on and all this other good stuff, right? And when they got done, they said, no, nothing. You hadn't done anything wrong. And they had a big tribunal later about it, a military court. And uh, the Army had to come back with a total, total apology, uh, promoted me again because I'd missed my promotion because they had me under investigation. Mm -hmm. So I got promoted. And uh, at that point, I was running. We were married. We were in Kentucky. Uh, I was running, uh, I was the head of uh, armor forces, in other words, writing all the things the armor community needed to do to get promoted and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they figured out by then that I had a radio and television degree and so I was doing local advertising for the army and, and uh, wow. And my wife, who had, uh, is now a, an army nurse, is working at the hospital as a head for uh, labor and delivery. Wow. So we're both now moving on in our careers and, yeah. and life was going pretty good. So let's fast forward to Iraq because that's the story. I've been, I've been waiting this whole time for you to tell that story. When, you, when we went to Iraq and the battalions, how you had to move them around and all that. If, remember you telling me this story? Well, yeah, the issue was this. Uh, while I was a major and still in, uh, well, actually this goes fast forward to the story I was telling you. Okay. Okay. While I was a major. Yeah. I started working on the whole Iraqi plan. 
Okay. I wrote the plan. I wrote that plan. I wrote all the defense plans for all the NATO nations called Article 5. Attack against one is attack against all. Mm -hmm. In other words, so we will respond. That got me over to NATO uh, at, at uh, SHAPE headquarters, Supreme Malik, uh, Europe, uh, under Wesley Clark. And that got to be kind of interesting because he got looking at my record from what I just told you about being investigated and all that, and it slowed down my career. Mm -hmm. So he called in a two-star general and called me into his office and said, I want him promoted because I got him doing all these things. See, I'm making him the, the Allied Command Europe's XO, and he doesn't have the rank, but I want him to do it. And uh, the general in charge of personnel said, well, he's missed a school. And then General Clark said, well, he missed a school because you guys messed up. It's not his fault. And by this time, the same major who had run the armor unit I told you about earlier that won the trophy yeah. is now a one-star general and in charge of all admin and everything else at shape. <laughs> and he came down and said, well, just promote him. <laughs> we don't need your approval. Yeah. And, and General Clark, of course, in charge of all the stuff, said, yeah, I don't know what I'm even talking to you about. I'm going to do it anyway. So I got a promotion that nobody usually gets. I had somebody just say, we're going to do it. Which, uh, when, I, when I retired uh, back in, as a, as a colonel, back in uh, 2000, I was literally going to go back and teach at the War Army War College. Okay. And Dickinson College, my wife had been accepted to law school there at Dickinson University. And I figured, well, I must be done with the Army. I made the rank of colonel uh, further than I thought, given what had happened. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still going to go teach tactics and write strategic plans at the War College, still have my finger in, in with the Army. I mean, I'm still teaching ROTC kids and people. Yeah. I had a master's degree in business and uh, international relations at that point. And so uh, the day just before... Just before the movers show up, this is how things work. This is kind of how my life has been. Just before the movers show up, my wife's not even with me in Belgium. She's at Heidelberg, Germany, running the well-being program for the Army, doing pregnancy PT things. She's head nurse of pediatrics. She's got 60,000 people in the community that she's running all the health things for. And she, I mean, she's tied mm -hmm. as special staff to the general, General Shinseki, who later becomes in charge of the VA and things. He, was, uh, he literally tagged her and said, I want you to write and take charge of all this stuff, uh, which included also uh, it was called the Area Support Group, which had all of Europe under her, basically under her, her care. Yeah. So the day before the movers were supposed to show up in Belgium and pick all of our stuff up, and she's already said, well, we're moving probably, and I'm going to give up this job, and I'll probably have to follow you. Uh, the phone rings. And it's the aide for General Clark. And he says, he says, Colonel Holloway said, uh, General Clark wants to talk to you. And I think, wow, this is really nice. He's going to congratulate me on retiring. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. He made an effort. This is nice. <laughs> Four-star general, all charge here, is going to call me up and say, say something nice, right? I'm, right. So I'm expecting that. I mean, I've already gotten a flag off the, off the Capitol awarded to me and all this other good stuff. Things you get when you retire. And he says, hey, uh, Glenn, it's General Clark. I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, nice to talk with you. He says, yeah. I says, well, maybe it's nice. I said, what do you mean, maybe it's nice? And he says, well, you know, you're supposed to be going back and teaching college. And I said, yeah, I'm already in the book. He says, well, you know, you're a regular Army officer. In other words, you're not really retired. You're no longer on active duty. You are still a regular Army officer, which means you still have a commission that you will never give up which we talk about now in the news and things, okay. you know, the whole kind of oath that everybody takes. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yes, sir. He says, well, I don't want you to go back to the United States. He says, and I have the power to put you back in uniform. That got my attention. And I said, well, yes, you do, sir. That's, that's, those are true statements. I said, where's this going? He says, well, you know, you started the plan for Iraq. And I said, yes, I want you to finish it. And you're going to go back to headquarters army in Heidelberg. And I think, well, that's my wife's at. That's not too bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, finish the plan. Now, this is 2000. You realize we didn't go back into Iraq in 2003. So I said, OK. I said, why am I going to do that? He says, because you don't want to go back in uniform. And I'm going to make it worth your while. He says, you're going to get a phone call. 
Okay. And I said, okay. So about an hour went by. Phone rang. I picked it up. The guy on the other end said, well, this is such and such. Has General Clark talked to you? And I said, yes, he has. He says, well, what will it take for me to have you come to Heidelberg and continue to write this, write this plan? And I was kind of being flippant. And I said, well, how about twice the wage I'm supposed to get to teach in college, tax-free, and you pay for all my moves? He says, done. So I went, wow, well, that was kind of cool. So then I called my wife and said, don't get rid of the apartment. I'm heading back to Heidelberg, and I guess we're going to stay there. Yeah. So I spent the next three years in Heidelberg writing plans, uh, doing things that got everything kind of prepped for the next attack into Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, worked with the Israeli Defense Force, and we set up the Iron Dome of uh, air defense for them. So I got to work with them. Uh, like I said, I was writing plans for all the nations and did that. Uh, mm -hmm. Still carrying a top secret clearance. Wow. Briefing the general all the time, which had good points and bad points. <laughs> uh, That's amazing. And, uh, and then in 2003, I was supposed to, uh, had all the plans written, everything was done. But you have to go into simulations, okay. and you have to work with the forces to get them ready to be deployed. Okay. Well, the general of Fifth Corps at the time was a General Wallace, three-star general, and he came downstairs and he says, you're going to go to Joint Forces Command and work for Admiral Gia Bastiani, who later becomes Chief of Staff of the, all the forces. And uh, I said, okay, and what am I going to do? He says, well, I want you to exercise these plan, flush, flush them all out, make sure they're going to go right, but at the same time, I want you to sneak in the headquarters. I want you to get everybody positioned in country after you make sure the plan's good and General, and General Franks, who'd been a lieutenant colonel, yeah. and Rumsfeld blesses it. Then you come brief me and tell me what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so I showed up over there. And uh, once again, not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm a retired colonel. I walk into the room. Sitting at the head table is a two-star Marine Corps general, and I'm standing back there, and he goes, are you Holloway? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, this is your chair right here. You're in charge. I just got a call from General Wallace, and he says, you are filling in for him, which makes you a three-star. It's, kind of, it's kind of like George Custer during the Civil War. Okay. He was a general running the cavalry. Once he got out, they busted him back to lieutenant colonel. Because really, he was only a lieutenant colonel. Hmm. So he was in the position to be a general. And okay. that's what they made him. Yeah. This is the same situation here. So I stepped into a three-star general's position, ran the whole plan, ran all the forces, got them all alerted, talked to all the commanding generals of all the divisions that were going to support us, gave them their deployment plans, went in and got all the plans set for what boats they were on and all that done, and basically worked the plan down to where it was totally correct, and uh, briefed Rumsfeld and forced our General Franks uh, on what was going on and where to worry about. Mm -hmm. So before that all got started, I thought it was done. I'd done my briefing. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, I'm going to lose my rank and go back to being a good old retired colonel, and that's fine with me because these people are going to go over there and be shot at and I get to go home. And so uh, another, a four-star general was supposed to be coming in. He was the general in charge of the coalition forces, which meant he only had, he had all the army forces, all the British forces, the Marines, Air Force, and all the coalition forces, which meant the Saudis and everybody else that were going in with us. Yeah. And the day before he was supposed to take over, he bought himself a brand new motorcycle and got hit in an intersection and killed. So I'm getting ready to go home when Admiral Gia Bastiani, commander of GIFCOM, comes down and says, hey, Glenn, you want to go to lunch? And I'm going, yeah, another time. I'm getting to go home, and this is great, and I'm going to have lunch. This guy's really nice. And we went and had lunch, and he looked at me and said, I don't have anybody that knows the plan but you. And I said, I don't like, I've seen this play out before. And I said, so what are you telling me? He says, you're now in charge of all coalition forces. I'm now telling you, you're sitting in a four-star general position, and you get to go bless this plan or not. It's on your shoulders. Let me know how it goes. What a nice lunch. Yeah. So I wound up having to talk to the Saudi Arabians and working with the British and, 
and briefing Rumsfeld once a week on the plan and getting Tommy Franks all spun up for when he took over and uh, wow, got the forces deployed, went mm -hmm. over and got the headquarters in place, went over and got all the battalions and all the divisions where they were supposed to go, Yeah, looked at it and kind of like God did in the creation. No, I'm not going to make an assimilation between me and God, but yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can kind of understand how it must have felt because when it was all set out, it was like, Good. Th this is good. <laughs> <laughs> and we're good to go. Yeah. And, I'm and you going can retire. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the truth. Though. That's what you want. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and so I went back to Europe and mm -hmm. uh, got everybody out of Europe deployed. And, uh, and you retired in 05, right? Or is it 06? 06. 06. So after you retire, I know this because you've told me you, you went back into, film, into filming and production. Why did you choose to go back into that after this experience that you've had that you could probably done a lot of amazing, cool jobs if you wanted? Well, it wasn't a direct change. I spent 10 years in Washington, D.C. area working for the Department of Defense. Okay. I wound up being their strategic war planner, so any of the plans that were written, I oversaw them. Um, I was in charge of critical infrastructure under the J-25 for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at all the critical infrastructure, uh, working as a contractor for Raytheon, for any operation that was going on anywhere in the world. So if we were looking at possibly putting forces in, in Africa, I had to go through and look at what was in Kenya, what did they have for electricity, housing, ports. I don't think Kenya has any ports. We have... You're landlocked, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... You know, rail systems, yeah. road systems. So you looked at all the critical infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, that would make an operation work and be able to support one. Mm -hmm. uh, went from that to DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and was the advisor for the director of that place. So and what's your uh, rank? At this point, I'm a civilian. Oh, but you retired as a two-star? No, I retired as a colonel, but I oh. was... It's kind, of called, it's kind of called breveted. I was placed in those billets ah. because they needed somebody who knew how to do it. Got you. Okay. And I was the only one who knew how to do it. I was the guy who wrote the plan. Got you, got you. So with that came, you know, mm -hmm. the Bible talks about great responsibility. Yeah. So whether you wanted it or not, it's like... You got it. It's your baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, Huh. No, I was working. I was working for generals in charge of all these areas mm -hmm. uh, as an advisor, and we got that all set up. Uh, and then in 2010, I realized that there was a problem coming, and it was going to impact our security and our food system. And I was running a very small farm in Virginia, working with some noted farmers. And uh, my wife and I got talking, and I said, we need to go learn how to farm and take care of ourselves and get a local food system set up. And so in 2013, I found a 1,200-acre farm that needed a partnership with it. The lady who owned his husband had died. And uh, she says, yeah, you're the kind of farmer I want. So we took over operation on a 1,200-acre farm in Idaho and moved from Virginia to Idaho. And uh, we set the farm up, uh, got written up in every newspaper. Uh, I literally was doing things that most farmers don't, no chemicals, all natural. It was the start of the organic movement. Um, I got picked up by a thing called the Savory Institute, which is headquartered right up here in Boulder, okay. uh, that does uh, holistic management type of farming. Mm -hmm. From that, I got written up in uh, Forbes and Fortune magazine. We took this farm and in three years increased its value from $2.3 million to $5.3 million, and the production increased by 500%. And we set up a whole food system. Uh, and that's where my kids got sick from a, a, a mycotoxin poisoning and mold, and the whole thing kind of fell apart because my wife and my daughter and my son uh, all got ill to the point they couldn't be on the farm due to all the chemicals that were being used in the farms around and everything else. You know, you're not an island because mm -hmm. the wind blows stuff around. Yeah. And so they left uh, in 2015 to go get well. And I was left running a 1,200-acre farm all by myself <laughs> with a house I couldn't go into. So I literally slept in the field on a cot with my animals for three and a half years. <laughs> Dedication to the cause. I had a haircut once every three months. That's a scary. And a bath once every six weeks. That's just nasty. Actually, I was very clean. Yeah. And I changed clothes every day. 
Uh, and if I really did have to take a bath, I'd jump in the horse trough or something else. But, you know, when you're out in, in nature and the water's in the 30s, you don't take long baths. You're kind of, no. you're kind of in and out. Uh, no. <laughs> but it, uh, it was, you know, it had pulled on all the things I knew before. Yeah. Literally, to make something like that a success, I had to know about surveying. I had to know about water. I had to know about grass and, and, and horticulture. I had to know about animal husbandry. I had to know about marketing because I was marketing all my own things. I'd set up my own uh, online uh, store and was busy yeah. delivering food to everybody. So, and you had to be your own vet. I mean, if a cow had trouble, you were the one pulling calves. You were the one that was sewing them up if they got cut. I mean, and sometimes sewing yourself up if you got cut. So, which I had to do when I ran a chainsaw across my knee. But uh, you applied everything to that point that I had learned, I applied against that farm. Wow. <laughs> to include some survival skills of yeah. waking up with being in a sleeping bag, being covered with snow and going, I think it's time to move into the barn. Huh? <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So we did that right up until... 16, wasn't it? Or was it 15? 2019, my wife and kids moved here in 2017 mm -hmm. because they found out this is a high, dry area that doesn't have any kind of commercial farming going on. Mm -hmm. So there isn't the glyphosate spray that you find in places like California or the Midwest or all that. They're just not using those here. Mm -hmm. So they started getting well. Uh, the lady who I was partnered with got greedy and decided now this farm is worth twice as much as what it was when you got here, I'm going to sue you to break the partnership. She had $60 million she had inherited. I had a retirement pay. You can kind of figure how that went. Yeah. So by 2019, I'd lost the battle of the, of the attrition, which is basically what it was, because every time I'd win a, any kind of appearance in court, she'd then just file an appeal. Yeah. And I'm being bled dry. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, uh, on March 29th, a day of infamy, I left the farm. My wife, Pam, and David and Caitlin were in Longview, Washington, seeing a doctor. And we had a lady watching our house that we had that was only now two years old here in Falcon. So I think everything's good. The settlement lawsuit, I got the money I'd put into the farm back. One good thing. Uh, but I lost everything on the farm and all the stuff I'd had there. And I got as far as Missoula, Montana, when I looked at my phone, because it chirped like it does when you get a message on email. And I thought, oh, well, so I looked at it. I pulled over to get a sandwich anyway. And it said, your insurance claim has been filed. And I went, uh-oh. The thing I thought was my kids and wife had maybe been in a car wreck because I wasn't with them. So I immediately get on the phone and say, are you okay? And then Pam, my wife, says, Oh, we're just fine. I probably should have called you earlier. And I said, you wrecked the car. She said, no, we didn't wreck the car. I said, then what do we have a claim in for? She says, well, for the house. The lady who was watching the house, I said, yeah. Well, she caught it on fire and burned it down. <laughs> and I said, oh. She says, so there's no rush for you to get home because nobody's there and you have nowhere to go. <laughs> and I said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Oh, wow. And so uh, I didn't drive fast from that point. I was kind of mulling this all over. I just lost yeah. the farm, and now I'd lost the, the house. And everything I'd accumulated for 28 years was gone. Everything. I had a bag of clothes, and they had a bag of clothes. And that was all we had that was left. Oh, and the two dogs lived because the neighbor went in and got them out before the place went down. So uh, I showed up here in Colorado Springs, I think, David and them drove back and got here about the same time I did. Wow. And, of course, we needed to find a place to live. Yeah. So we went to a real estate agent that had been recommended. We parked across the street from her driveway, went in and talked to her. She says, I think I know a really good place for you. I'm going to go check on it. I'll be right back. You can talk to my husband about other things that he was doing. We had something in common. I don't remember what it was at the time. So she went out the door. And about two minutes went by, she came back through the door. And she walks up to my wife and she says, I don't know how to tell you this, but I didn't realize you'd parked across the street and I backed out real quick and I just broadsided your car <laughs> and totaled it. <laughs> and I kind of looked at my wife and I said, oh, I should have figured. I mean, it's the way things have been going, right? Yeah. So uh, with everything gone, there are turning points in your life. Yes. 
this was just one of them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's nothing left but to rebuild sure. and reassess where you really want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you that there was a spiritual battle going on. I looked at my wife and said, we're going to talk about this in four months. Right now, I don't want to talk about any of this because I'm probably not going to be real rational about it mm -hmm. or even understand why, mm -hmm. and I don't want to go there. So we didn't talk about it for about four months. Uh, we found a place to rent, and life was good, and, and wow. we started rebuilding. That's and amazing. now we are here at the road. Mm -hmm. um, we came to the road because I am very, as you can possibly pick up during this whole dissertation, I'm very goal-oriented. Yeah. And I plan, and then I look at what needs to be done through the planning, and then I go execute. And I really don't have a whole lot of tolerance for anything in between. And somehow that gets in conflict sometimes with my godly spiritual nature in the sense of, why didn't you do that? <laughs> this is a timeline. We're on a timeline here. We've got to get this done. And so I've had to really learn to execute grace yeah. and tolerance. <laughs> and uh, other things that yes. when you transition from a total military organization that's all taught to do specific things mm -hmm. to a civilian organization and then you take that down to the next little niche which is a church organization that's supposed to have all these traits these spiritual gifts you have to kind of change your outlook on all of them as you're going into <laughs> down the line to, to that point yeah and uh, it's been a bit of a challenge, uh, but we are working with the church. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and I came to this church because they're not afraid to do what I believe pastors should do. Pastors should lead their flock. Yeah. Not say it's tough times. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to pay me money to close my doors? I'll close my doors and I'll tell the flock to go home. That's just not leadership. Yeah. Leadership is saying my job is to take care of the flock, just what Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep, look after my flock. Pastors are supposed to do that. It doesn't say, look after my flock during good times. And then if things get a little rough, well, hey, tell them come back when they're good again. Mm -hmm. We don't need sunshine True. pastors. <laughs> we True. need what, what Pastor Steve talks about is blood-stained allies mm -hmm. who are going to wade in and make a difference yeah. in the name of Jesus and under God's direction, mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Spirit for discernment, mm -hmm. and then move out so the people you're responsible for are being taken care of and being filled not only physically and taking care of the tabernacle of their body, mm -hmm. but spiritually. Yeah, that's true. And that's his job. Yeah. As far as I can see, he's the only one in the area doing it, and that's why I'm here. Amen to that. That's awesome. <laughs> that, wow. So that's a that's a very general like story. He went Ted 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 your whole life. I love that. Well, no, that was perfect. <laughs> I, I appreciate that because it's very chronological. Because I always try to do that, but sometimes you think yes, you can never do well, it. What's a progression? <laughs> yes, life's a progression, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, aren't you going through a progression right now? <laughs> yes, I am. So, I am. Uh, so that's awesome. Thank you. Oh, Thank glad you. to be here. That was an amazing story. And are you doing anything right now that the people can get to see? Because I know you do a lot of commentary on... Yes, right now. And I'll talk to the camera for this. Right now, every individual out there needs to start getting involved. The only thing that you can do wrong right now is to do nothing. We are in the fight of our lives against principalities and the heavenlies of evil against good. And we're seeing that with the government. We've gone through masking. We've gone through COVID. We've got these vaccines coming up where they're going to actually demand that you have a vaccine record before you get food, before you get on an airplane, before you can get gas. It's becoming a total, what I call a soft totalitarian state. And we need to fight back and stop it now. And the next move they're coming after is your guns and your food. And the food is a real important part, and that's what I'm working here with the, with the mm -hmm. church on, yeah. is to try to set up a food system so when those people that own amounts of land, like Bill Gates and Ted Turner and everything, decide they're going to use it as weapons against us, like the Russians did against the Ukraine, mm -hmm. we'll already have a food system set up and we will have yeah. something to survive. 
Is there a way they can keep track or keep up with what you're doing? We are working with the pastor and a steering group on that. Uh, I've already got the plan written. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to brief it. Uh, we were going to brief it on Wednesday, but we're going to brief it, uh, I think, the 7th of April. Okay. And I'm sure that we'll be putting out periodic uh, mm -hmm. updates on it through through the church itself. Okay. And if need be, mm -hmm. like you probably know, I'm not afraid to step up in front of everybody and say, this is what we got to do, and I need your help. But I need your commitment to it. I don't need sunshine warriors. I need somebody that's going to get in there and be a bloodstained <laughs> ally yes. and fight this battle with me and awesome. with the church. That's awesome. Thank you, Glenn, so much for oh, well, thank you. sharing your story. You do more around here than I have so far, <laughs> that's for sure. I <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And remember, we all have a story. What's your story? Goodbye. Hey, you made it till the end. Thank you for tuning in and watching this amazing interview. If you want to get a hold of Emmanuel, you can do so on social media. There's also a blog where you can read some of his writings. God bless you. And remember, everybody has a story. What's your story?